Uh, my Twitter name is G. Leonhardt, couldn't be more complicated. Um, and I'm going to monitor what you say on data as a new all in the hashtag right here. So if you have questions or insults, you can uh, put them in here. Um, so my company, the Futures Agency, Star was actually a part of this as well. Uh, what we do real quickly, this is really what we do, we pay attention to what people say, and uh, we turn the obvious around back to our clients, which are companies from all over the place, technology companies, media companies, to explain the future to them. Um, I'm trying something new tonight, it's called GERD Cloud. Okay? Uh, it's a mobile device, it's a, like a box, it sits right here, it's called GERD Cloud, so if you look on your Wi-Fi list, one is called GERD Cloud, and if you use a password, GERD Cloud, no capitals, just straight through, you can download anything you want from the USB that we're sharing here with you tonight. All my books, my slideshows, and all the presentations of the other guys as well. So there's about two gigs of stuff that you can download. You'll be here all night, you know, but it uh, works really well. So the way that works really quite simply, you join the network, you use your browser on the iPhone or iPad, just use the Safari, uh, type GoCloud into the URL, and uh, should you be bored with the presentations, you can just download and read that, all that stuff right there. Download anything you like. It should work. It's the first time I'm trying this. So if it doesn't work, then uh, you know, complain to Stowe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the theme of tonight, you've heard this many times. Hello, Andreas. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, the theme of tonight is the idea of data, the new oil, and privacy and publicity. Uh, this is actually a theme that we stole from a bunch of people in 2006, including Clive Humby from the AMA, whoever that is. I don't know who it is. But uh, it became a really powerful theme in the last half a year because of this discussion about what's called big data. Okay? And 2006, the European Commissioner, or 2009, already said that personal data is the new oil of the internet and the currency of the digital world. Now, this led me to think about one thing. You know, so far, the currency of the world hasn't been data. Right? It has been oil. And, of course, you know we've, we've had wars over oil. And now we're trying to get off the oil, at least in Europe we are. Uh, so now we have this idea of a new currency coming up, which is quite an interesting discussion. And just a couple of days ago, I think three, uh, four weeks ago, the White House published the Consumer Data Privacy Report, which is really quite interesting. Huge 140-page uh, PDF. I've only skimmed the surface, but there's a short summary of that. You can see it on the Huffington Post, the Privacy Bill of Rights. This debate, of course, in Europe, I live in Switzerland, is different than the debate here for many reasons, I'll get into that in a second, but uh, when you download my PDF, you can read all that stuff they're talking about, including, of course, the control issue, right? So when it's about data, of course, the number one issue is control. Uh, that's clearly what it comes down to. Um, data is becoming cheaper and more abundant across the world. I mean, all this graph pointing in one direction, which is beyond Moore's law, right? Faster, quicker, more, all the time instant, always on, right? This stuff is happening much faster at much lower cost. Uh, in developing countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, of course, clearly all the data is mobile. So that's really screaming along at very high speed. And uh, in data, we have to essentially distinguish between volunteered data, that's what we give, for example, to Facebook or to Google, observed data, which is Google observing our travels on the web, and inferred data, which is basically deducted from the other data. That's where it gets interesting, that's why it's red. Right? What do we do about inferred data? Um, software company Redmonk says that we're moving from the age of software to the age of data. Right? Which is an interesting angle when you think about how many companies we have in the software business you know, that deal with data as well. But the market cap, market valuation of Google is higher than all of the content companies in the US that are in New York combined, like CBS, NBC, and all the other ones, because they are a data company. Right? So the age of data, as Kevin Kelly has been riffing off in one of his brilliant videos recently, he talks about what's happening in the age of data is no longer pages and PCs and all that stuff, it's streams, the cloud, and us, we, and data. Right? So you see, for example, music services like Spotify, they're in the cloud, right? So we're not essentially buying the music, we're buying the access to a bunch of stuff that happens there. Right? Different business model. In this network topography map, you can sort of see what's happening in the last 50 years, basically, or 20 years, right? That we're moving to a society that is completely networked. Right? And in fact, I call this the network society. 
Uh, and this is a key problem and, and a key opportunity for us because all of a sudden data becomes center stage in this society, right? For example, imagine that we're starting to publish all of the public information and educational things like MIT has done for a long time onto a network of connected people. People can study at MIT from Siberia. Right? Data is becoming a huge asset in this whole discussion. And basically, uh, the earned media thing that marketers are talking about, there's a significant amount of control loss that you can see that happens when people are starting to share stuff rather than when they get in a central place. Uh, so what we do every day is this, right? We like something, we forward something, we comment on something, we rate, we rate something. So it becomes a momentum of control loss. You know, when I talk to my clients about what's happening on the web, the number one thing I always hear is like, we're losing control losing control of our evaluation, of our distribution, of our customers. It's basically becoming a race for control. So this is, of course, a big issue when we talk about the other things that are happening here, including my, my clicker isn't really working, is that we're now becoming people of the screen, as Kevin Kelly has said many times, uh, not people of the book. And there's a big difference here is because people of the screen are data producers comments, ratings, forwards, you know, all that stuff that we do every day. And it's not just us, because actually in America, we're behind the curve on this. And if you go to China or India or Brazil, people are rampant on those screens, just doing all kinds of things there, uh, producing data. So you could say that meta content, which is content about content, is exploding in value. Um, Stowe will explain this later, how Facebook is the new AOL. I stole your line, sorry for that. But uh, basically, <laughs> you don't say that anymore then. But basically what's happening is that we are the content of Facebook, right? And we're, we're actually the programming of Facebook is us. Right? Uh, some people have said that Facebook is a perpetual TV reality show. Right? Basically that we are, we are the program of Facebook. Right? So you can basically say that what we do here is we're, we're commenting, we're doing all the other stuff that people like to do there. Uh, we have virtual <laughs> web, augmented reality data. We have data that is superimposed on top. We have, of course, the new Google Glasses, right? all that stuff. And this is one of the issues that's happening with data is that we're heading in a world of total transparency. I mean, WikiLeaks, you may think about WikiLeaks what you like, right? but it has proven that very few things can stay behind the curtain. right? So here's a video of the FedEx guy delivering that you may have seen and he just throws the computer monitor over the fence, right? And uh, two hours later, this video finds itself uh, on YouTube with eight million views or something and uh, causes a huge chain reaction. You've seen this video probably here with uh, um, the, uh, the uh, Occupy thing, it's, I think it was UC Davis actually, where uh, the policeman pepper sprays people as if he was uh, administering some sort of salmon or something, a uh, sermon. I mean, it was basically just without any consideration, as you can see here. So we're living now in a world that is so transparent um, that we have to wonder what is actually staying not transparent, right? I mean, are, are we becoming naked? Right? It used to be the public see had to be paid for. We had to pay to be public, right, for people to see us. Now it's the verse we have to pay to be private which is kind of a weird thing, right? It's like a, a flip. All of us can be public just by posting something, right? But if we don't want that, we probably have to pay, and there's search engine like duckduckgo.com or reputation.com or so that want to administer what happens there. This guy, who's also a futurist, says, when you change the instruments, you know, technology, you will also change the entire social theory that goes with them, right? So the instrument of linking is a, a huge change this is a huge change. Clearly, in India, more cell phones and toilets. Right? I mean, that, the society is changing so quickly because of the use of mobile devices. Reputation.com, electric cars. When we change this instrument, we change the entire society, right? How we interact. I mean, why would you buy a car as a status symbol is it going, if it's going to be a Prius? You know, clear, you have other reasons. You know, the car as a status symbol is ending. Self-driving car. If that becomes a reality, the car companies are in deep trouble, right? Because the entire food chain of how we do things is changing. So we're moving from a world from independence, you know, Walt Disney, Universal Music, maybe Microsoft, to the world of interdependence. Uh, and this is taken from a, a great movie that just came out by Timothy, uh, uh, Tiffany Schlein called Connected the Movie. 
She talks about interdependence. Right? And why is this important for data? Because clearly, there are a lot of things that are happening with data that point us to one destination, which means we have to collaborate to make sense out of it. And we also have to collaborate it from doing damage, which I'll show you in a second what that could possibly look like. You've all seen this, right? The BP disaster. Oil, of course. Now, a similar disaster would be a disaster like this, where Facebook could leak and <laughs> leak out my information, as has happened in the past, right? Would be a similar accident of similar proportions, where people could see things that are not supposed to see. And we could, in fact, be sitting here looking at ourselves already in the future, or as already being in the oven, uh, as far as the data is being concerned. Uh, then we have, of course, a big issue in that what we've done on Facebook is in many ways a game, right? I mean, it's, it's an interesting game, right? But is it, is it real? And of course, then the question really is, uh, when you look at all this stuff and with the Facebook IBO coming up, IPO coming up, data and social and mobile is becoming a huge, a trillion dollar market. Uh, this is, in fact, why the telecoms are looking at this market, right? They're saying, wait a minute, we're, three, we're worth three trillion dollars a year? We should have a piece of this, right? The data, mobile, social, solimbo, as people call it, market. And then we have various confusions in the last couple of years. You know, here's uh, uh, Julian Assange saying, you know, I give private information to corporations to you for free, and I am the villain. And Zook says, I give your private information to corporations for money. I am man of the year. There are, there's many issues that we're facing for the first time. What are the standards of this? Right? What is the standard for privacy? Who is supposed to use it? Why? Why am I doing this? Why am I not doing this? Right? This is actually quite confusing because it's a first time thing. I personally think that a do not track option will be very important. But we have a big problem here, right? Because in a way, we're getting so much stuff for free from those companies that are using our data, like Google that if we were to ask them not to track us, they would lose the whole argument of giving it to us to, in the first place, right? Because that, that is kind of the deal, right? Can we have the cake and eat it, right? Look at this research, right? The Wall Street Journal, I just did this this morning, actually. They did research and I actually voted uh, yes. Would you use a do not track button on your web browser? And, you know, almost 90% of those people said they would. But if they did this, Advertising on the web would be dead. Which means that we wouldn't get the free stuff that we're now getting. I mean, how can we get free YouTube if we don't want them to track us? Because then they couldn't advertise to us. So this is a big problem in the machinations of, uh, of the advertising business, which is roughly a trillion dollar business. Funding a lot of content. So I thought I would give you a few reminders as far as oil is concerned, right? I mean, you guys are all aware of the discussions around oil, but just as a context, right, what we see here, uh, we're consuming currently about 85 million barrels every single day of oil. And various countries have various levels of consumption, but the US, of course, is a leader in oil consumption <laughs> in general, as, of course, is Brazil, which is interesting. And so they, uh, oil use is widely spread. Of course, wars are fought over oil. Right? Clearly, we know that. Uh, this is from Nancy Pelosi, which is right from here from San Francisco, I think, right? Shown the extreme profits of oil companies by having a monopoly on the, what they're doing. Right? And Obama is currently trying to address this. But worst of all is the subsidies that oil has been receiving over the years. I mean, if you're looking at this zoomed up a little bit, right? 69% of the budget goes to fossil fuel subsidies, tax breaks, direct spending. So it's an interesting uh, change that we're going on. Of course, lobbying is huge there, and this, this cartoon kind of sells it, uh, says it all. It's a hybrid that runs on oil and addiction and government handouts. So oil is a huge problem, and a huge problem. Now when we think about this, who is the next BP or Exxon or Mobile or Shell in the data space? Who will do the same thing with our data? Because I can tell you, of course, that business is going to be bigger than oil in terms of money. Because right, we're talking about five billion people connected producing data. So here's some numbers on this, how big it could be from McKinsey. $300 billion could be saved in US health healthcare using a data-driven system of 
APIs and exchanging pass uh, uh, client data and so on. So is big data like big oil? If that's the case, we're in deep trouble. Is that going to be the same variation of the same topic? And as far as drilling into our data, into our brain, so to speak, at who and how and when, do we allow this? An interesting test case is Siri. Hey Siri, do you love me? How can I tell? You just know. Okie dokie. Okay. Everything's okay. Okay. Okie dokie. Okay. I'm I'm showing this not because it's cute, it is, but Siri does not just do this on the box, right? It goes in the cloud and everything I say is recorded and analyzed, right? And it adds to a huge amount of information about me, but also about others. Right? And Siri gets dramatically better every day because of the stuff that we put in it. Right? This is a whole different cup of tea, right? This is more matrix than it is, you know, a computer. Right? that we're creating there, right, is in the cloud, and then we have service like, like Echo Nest, also from San Francisco, right, analyzing music data, creating enormous value by comparing music to each other and ratings of people. And then we have the other side of that, like the New York Times is able to find out that I had seen their pages already 12 times this month, so therefore I can't get in anymore, right? I have to pay for the paywall, right? That's how they're using data to enforce payment. So if I did, if I did do, not, do not track with those guys, then they couldn't charge me. Right? So all these things are happening. I mean, basically what we're seeing is, I think beyond dollars, big data must also allow for common benefits. Benefits of the society, when we look at these numbers in terms of the growing torrent, right? And uh, the EU Vice President Vivian Redding says, the great threat to individual liberty in the digital age comes from companies that use our data to enrich themselves, buying and selling our most intimate details. That's the kind of discussion that we have in Europe. <laughs> that would be considered anti-business here. So we don't want to go there. But this is an important topic, right? Is that, is that what's going to happen with our data that we use? And do we want that? And do we, I think, in some cases we do want that because we have a benefit, right? But I think we need to be careful and retain the Internet's ethos of the commons. Sounds very California, right? But we wouldn't have the Internet if it wasn't for the ethos of the commons, right? Something that we do together, something that involves neutrality, interoperability, shareability, choice, level playing fields. Right? So in my view, that is a top concern that we need to retain this, right? And not sell it all, right? Because then we won't have any more. And openness, you know, the last point in this, right? <laughs> invariably increases risk. So when I'm open about my data on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or my blog, right, then somebody can come and slander me or abuse the stuff or steal my pictures. You know, that's the risk I have to take. I mean, I think we can't have the benefit without having the risk. So this is a real difficult scenario. Each culture around the world feels differently about this and each age group, of course. Right? I mean, in Asia, this is not a topic. Right? Talk to a 15-year-old kid in Tokyo, this is anything, you can have anything from them. Right? Because the benefit of being in a group is so much larger. So real quick, a couple ideas of the new economics of publicity. I mean, the benefit of publicity, of being public, you know, uh, um, Universal McCann calls this the influence revolution. And this is a shot from, from the website where you can have, be measured. I'm sure you guys are familiar with cloud and other services of that nature, I'll show you in a second. But you can get special treatment, check in into a hotel by having them check your social status, whatever that means, you know, using cloud or peer index. This is the Palms Hotel in Las Vegas, where if you have a cloud score above 50, you get an upgrade to a suite. For whatever reason that is, you know, I, I can't figure it out, but we'll discuss it in a second. Right? And of course, every meeting we go to, people go check you out on LinkedIn beforehand, right? So, is that a benefit? I think it's definitely an economic, right? Because it's an economic fact that I can look at your stuff, makes me feel different about you, influences my decision about what you do. Jeff Bezos says, when it comes to the really important decisions, 
data trumps intuition every time. Okay, that's kind of a tough statement. Maybe Andreas can elaborate on this a little bit later with his background. But here's an interesting thing. Okay, here's my cloud score from just two days ago. Okay, and I don't give a damn about my cloud score. I just an example, right? Just a little while ago, it was 72, and I can't figure out why or how. Right? I think what, what's happening here is that basically I think humans are a lot more complex and nonlinear than algorithms. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world where I'm judged and motivated by an algorithm. I mean, not a bad algorithm, at least. We already have a lot of judgment in algorithms in our everyday life by just using Google. So this, is, this brings up a big question. Right? Do we want those algorithms to run what we do or decide for us? Right? Is it a reduction of human complexity to satisfy the machine? Parenthesis. I think it could be. That's something we have to look at. And I, I would, that kind of worries me, if that's what it is. You know, so I, I came to the conclusion that privacy is a human right, but publicity seems to be technology's right. The right of technology is that wants us to be public. As Kevin Kelly writes in his book, right? what's the title of his book, the last? What Technology Wants, right? Read the book, then you know basically what technology wants. This brings up some hairy issues, I think, in terms of how far we want to go down this. And, and of course, we are already paying with our data. Right? We're using Google, LinkedIn, Skype, and Skype, we're literally paying with bandwidth because somebody else is making a phone call through us. Right? And you can go to a service called Pay with a Tweet, and you get free books there and free movie downloads by paying with a tweet. So paying with data is already a really, really powerful model. And this, we have to ask the question, I'm going to wrap up here very soon, right? <laughs> is this a Faustian deal? You know, it's free, but they sell your information. Now, I would argue, if I'm going to sell my information, like I have, on Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter, right? then I have to be okay with how they use it to a certain degree because that's the deal, right? I can't just tell them not to use it anymore and go backwards and take the value out that I already have enjoyed, right? This brings up a very difficult question. How far does this game go? And how do I control that value? Do I have to control the value? Right? So this is a difficult term. I mean, if we're looking down the road, you know, a world that would be completely open with data would allow us, as they do in Japan, to scan the face of a woman or man when you're dating and get up, you know, see their social profile superimposed over the date, right? And decide to move on to the next person, right? I've tried it. It wasn't a very good date. I, I'm married anyway. But so here's the question, right? It comes down to what is authorized. What are we allowing? What can we control? And what do we like? And, and this is where it gets complicated. Huh? I think we have new powers now, being part of the social network society, the global society, right? <laughs> now we have, to also, we have to also learn the new responsibilities. I can tell you, I have two kids, right? The responsibility of having these powerful tools and making complete ass of yourself on, on Facebook or so, it's, it's quite a big responsibility. And that we have to learn, just like we have to learn we don't want to call every person all the time just because we have a mobile phone. Right? <laughs> and we did learn that, right? It took a while. Right? So what the New York Times shows as the bleeding data. Yeah? Maybe I'm okay with my foot to bleed, but not my leg. No, this is a big responsibility that we have to decide. So I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I have a bunch of apps you can download. Just go to futurist.com mediafuturist.com, and you can see all that stuff. Um, again, my free books are on the GERD cloud, or you can just Google 